What is up, everybody? My name is Sam Deiter. I'm one of the senior technical artists, and I'm with Tim Hobson. I'm one of the engine support techs. And today we're going to be diving into physics uh, inside of UE4. So let's just go ahead and get started. Um, so first we're going to start off with what, what is physics. And physics is just basically very, very simple, very high level. Uh, you're trying to replicate the forces of nature, such as gravity or wind, uh, in the virtual world, all right? And that's what we're talking about when we talk about physics inside of UE4, trying to simulate some of the natural phenomena that you find in the real world and the digital one. Um, with that said, UE4 is not a physically correct tool to simulate uh, physics reactions in. Uh, if you're looking for something that will give you, you know, mathematically correct physics, physical uh, simulation when you run it, you would need to implement another type of system because the physics system that UE4 uses is it's designed at for games. So they make a lot of assumptions, they cut corners and things like that to give you a more performant physics interaction. Um, than that you would see if you made uh, like a physics interaction and in, say uh, DDC like uh, Maya or Max or Houdini or something like that. Got any anything else you want to uh, add to that one? No, you pretty much nailed it on that part. Okay. So. <laughs> um, and <laughs> let's see here. The last thing we're going to be doing is this is going to be a general overall physics. Um, we are not going to be covering physicalized vehicles in this particular live stream. So any questions that you have about that, uh, we're not going to cover in this particular one because vehicles is a whole other thing all into its own. So um, that's kind of our intro to physics. Um, let's go jump into our next topic here. And the next thing I want to talk about is deterministic versus non-deterministic. Um, basically, deterministic means each time you run the simulation, the results are going to be exactly the same. You know, if I drop this mouse, it's going to fall right down on the table each time. Um, that would be a deterministic simulation. Non-deterministic means that each time I run the simulation, the results are going to be different. So again, I take this mouse and I drop it. This time I might drop it and it might bounce over to the right. I might drop it the next time and it might go over to the left. It could go forwards or backwards. Um, it's non-deterministic, meaning that you know, its results are going to vary. And Unreal is a non-deterministic model. You can get physics reactions that uh, happen the same way, but it's not going to be the exact same thing every single time. There can also be uh, external forces that um, interact with the physics simulation, causing it to be uh, non-deterministic. Is there anything else you've got to, <laughs> to add nope. on that particular one? Nope, so okay. far. <laughs> Okay. Thank you pretty much. So a, a lot of this stuff comes from uh, <coughs> things that I've seen people ask on the forums or questions that I know people have about physics. So um, the next thing I want to talk about, and this is a big one that I know a lot of people always have questions about, and it's is UE4 or does UE4's physics run on the CPU or the GPU? And mainly UE4 uses uh, physics on the CPU. And we currently do not support GPU physics or GPU apex. That means all of your destructible stuff that happens, those pieces that fall off, their physics are still being calculated on the CPU. Now, we do have GPU particles in UE4, but they're agnostic. What that means is that they'll run on any card. If I have an NVIDIA card, the GPU physics will work on my card. If Tim's got an ATI card, mm -hmm. they'll work on his ATI card. If somebody else has an Intel card, <laughs> even if let's say Intel made video <laughs> cards, uh, besides the integrated ones, if they did have one, then it would work on that in the same way. It's agnostic. It'll work on any type of uh, GPU. Um, also, the GPU particles will have very uh, simple physics applied to them. And the other thing that you can do with particle collisions, and I think I believe it started in 4.9, is right. particle collisions with distance fields, which is something we'll get into a little bit later. Um, but the main thing to take away from this is very, very minimal GPU support for, for physics. Most of the physics are run on the CPU inside of UE4. So anything else you want to talk about in the, in the intro before we get into some of the actual no, uh, meat and potatoes <laughs> of this? Go ahead okay. and dive on in. Have All right. Fun. So first thing we're going to talk about <coughs> is collision. because, And the reason we're hitting on this is because collision is key to getting physics to work correctly. If your mesh doesn't have collision on it, you are not going to be receiving any collision events. Um, you're not going to see any collision happen. Basically, nothing is going to happen uh, with your mesh when you try to interact with it if you don't have any collision on it. Um, 
now how do I make Collision? Well, there's a couple different ways you can make it. You can make it inside your DCC, uh, which is like Maya or Max, um, and then export it with your mesh. You can create it inside of the Static Mesh Editor um, by adding, let me, uh, let me pull the Static Mesh up really quick and show you what I'm talking about here. Um, content, filters, and Static Meshes. Oops, and it would help if I didn't have anything <laughs> in my filter. So we'll just grab the first mesh <coughs> here, which happens to be this big, huge box. <laughs> and the collision options I'm talking about are coming up here to the main toolbar, going to collision, and we have a whole bunch. We can add some flight sphere collision to it. Uh, I can remove my collision. Um, you, you see that just added a little box right there. A little hard to see, but the collision is actually this little line right here that it's adding around there. Um, and the other thing you have here is the auto convex. This will add collision. Um, this is a probably a horrible shape to <laughs> demonstrate that with because um, go for the head mesh. Uh, where's um, the head mesh? Right there in the middle. Two more over. Oh, there the we go. if it was a snake, it would have bit me. <laughs> All right, so here's the head. And we're gonna, we'll do this auto convex, which is actually already up here. So I'm just going to crank him up a little bit. And there we go. We'll click Apply. We'll let this dice this up. So basically what this is doing is it's uh, making a bunch of little tiny boxes to the mesh, figuring out where the bounds of the mesh is. And then it's going to make the collision uh, kind of hug this object, if you will. And you see it does actually a fairly decent job of gener generating collision that stays within the profile of this mesh or its silhouette. So you can see that the it's a pretty good job at hugging it. Um, and I'd say that, that would be pretty good for a project that I was working on or something right. of that nature. Um, before we exit on this, uh, real quick, just to go over, up there in the top left, you'll see where it says num, or, uh, num primitives. This is the number of holes that it actually makes uh, for your mesh based on the auto convex. So the higher your accuracy on that, the more holes it's going to make because uh, you can only have a certain number of concave uh, or non-concave uh, holes. Um, and collision primitives is a good right. thing to, uh, to touch on. Um, as with everything else inside of 3D, the more primitives you have, the more expensive that mesh is going right. to become uh, to do collisions with. It's always better to opt on the side of having fewer collision prims, if at all possible, trying to um, uh, combine them. You know, if you have four that go across, to make up a surface, see if you can actually get rid of all those four and just pull your mesh out so you have one that fills up the entire, uh, the entire surface because that will make it uh, much, uh, much cheaper to run. So again, uh, the last thing that you can make collisions from inside of UE4 is the fat editor. And uh, the fat editor only works for skeletal meshes. So uh, we right click on a skeletal mesh and I guess at the very top and create. Yeah, there we go. Create a physics <coughs> asset. So this will give you, um, this box will come up. What this box is basically doing is it's saying, let me, uh, there you go. What this, what this is saying is it's saying for a bone size that's five centimeters, we're going to make a, we're going to make a sphere. We're going to orientate that sphere along the, uh, the bone axis. Um, we want to make sure that we attach this around the dominant weights. So whichever, if it's being influenced by two or more, we want to influence it, or we want to select whichever one has the greater influence. Um, we want to, we can create joints. We can uh, tell if those joints are going to be like, like free flowing, like all crazy, or if they're going to be locked in position so that the guy's just, he doesn't actually do anything. And then you can press OK, and it's got some missing bones in it, but that's, and you'll get something like this, right? And we've got our awesome little Michelin man <laughs> here. Um, and then you can come in, and you can move the bodies around. And this is the fat editor. And you can press simulate here. And uh, they haven't changed stuff on me. Yeah, mm -hmm. we can move them around and watch him break dance. Um, so this is the fat editor. And this is just, again, one of the other ways that you can generate collision that will interact with your physics properties. And again, the fat editor is purely for skeletal meshes. Um, so let's talk about the next thing that everybody mm. always wants to do, and that is per poly collision. And uh, I'm going to let Tim take the lead on this one because he knows quite okay. a bit about this particular area. Okay. Um, so with per poly collision, um, typically it's a, it's a way of using uh, 
your static mesh to create collision for your geometry. Um, and if you go down to the, what's it? Uh, it's called collision screen. complexity. Sorry, yeah, we, we, we look like we're blind, but the uh, the text is so tiny on the screen. And then if we use the complex as simple, this will. It's always the bottom one as well. <laughs> always the bottom one. We use the uh, the actual mesh's geometry as its own collision. Um, there are some caveats to using this, though. Uh, um, uh, I just hit yeah. uh, Alt-C on the keyboard to make the collision come up, and I'll hit it again. Uh, sorry, I just wanted oh, to tell people yeah, how I was doing that. Um, so your character will now, you know, if you're playing in this world or whatever, if it's a static mesh it'll, or, or static in the world, it'll actually collide against that mesh and, and use the mesh geometry um, itself. If it's set to movable, um, there are some caveats to that, though. Um, Sam. Where'd he go? <laughs> uh oh. Oh, we've lost him. Where did he go? I don't know. <laughs> That's oh. Let's move him over here. And yeah, uh, as Tim so was saying, there's some caveats to um, s per poly collision is extremely expensive and it's falling through the ground for for some particular reason, which I'm not a hundred percent sure why. Um, but basically, if you have every single object in your level using per poly collision, you're going to have an extraordinarily expensive uh, physics and, and collision calculation because it's basically testing against every single triangle uh, to make sure that you know this object can be uh, that when this object intersects something, uh, an impulse can be applied uh, or physics can be applied, which is an extraordinarily expensive thing to do. Um, the other type of collision, which is the one that you saw in everything else, which uh, I'll just come into this guy right here, and uh, we'll just add a simplified sphere on him. This is much cheaper because right. it's just going to be testing for the bounds of this radii that you see right here, or this, this spherical actor. Let me get out of the way there so we don't get that weird reflection going on. Um, but it's basically just going to be checking for if something has collided with the the outside of this, which is much, much cheaper than if you were checking for every single one of the polygons, such as we have in uh, this particular example here with the uh, with the bomb. You know, each time, each frame, each time this goes down or each time this moves, it's going to check to see, oh, did something hit here? Did something hit here? Did something hit here? Did something hit here? So on and so forth. And you can see that could become very expensive over time. And Again, that's per poly collision, and to enable it, I'll find it in my content browser, and we just uh, back oops, up. Yeah, right here. It's under the static mesh settings for collision complexity. So usually it's set to default, which you can see. It changes the color of my collision over here, and I set this down to use complex as simple. You're not going to see anything update in there, but when we come back over here to the level, mm. you'll see that it's green. One other quick thing, too, is like if you enable the complex uh, or colli collision complexity, um, it will disable any other collision holes that you actually have already mm. set up. So yeah. So you'll if you're seeing any, any kind of weird behavior, if you've set that up or if you go to set up collision after the fact, um, be sure and check that. <laughs> so the other thing, you cannot have and correct me if I'm wrong on this one, Tim, but you cannot have two pieces of geometry that are both set as per poly interact with one another? Right. Okay. So basically what that means is if I uh, if I was making a Rune Goldberg machine, which is one of those crazy contraptions where it's like it has to go through like 20 steps to you know switch on a light switch. Um, if you were making something like that, um, where you would need some precise collision um, or some pr precise physics interaction, what I would do if I was setting something up like that is I would only have per poly collision on the object that I'm trying to move around. So if I have a bunch of uh, balls or these bombs doing something, per poly collision would be on them, but everything else in my world would use standard collision that I create inside of the static mesh editor or inside of a DCC like Maya or Max or something of that nature. Um, we do use physics for our collision inside of UE4, but it only supports forces, uh, forces and impulses on, ge on, <laughs> on geometric <laughs> primitives such as capsules, spheres, boxes, and convex holes. And uh, if you're not sure what convex is, there's actually two terms, convex and concave. And basically how I think about it is you can have objects that don't look like Pac-Man 
<laughs> because as soon as an object comes back in on itself, like, Pat Ma like Pac-Man's mouth would, so he'd be circular like this, and he'd come back in on himself, that would be a convex, concave. or concave, sorry, concave object, because it goes back <laughs> in on itself. A convex object would mean that it no longer turns in on itself, so you can't actually go inside of the object. Um, and Unreal o only support convex holes, meaning that we don't support the classic uh, Pac-Man style hole. If you search right. for um, convex versus concave in the documentation, there's uh, actually some good diagrams that explain what yeah. I just... Actually, even just looking UCX collision, um, that's a good search term for it as well. Bring it right up. Um, so let's see. So we've talked about um, <coughs> making sure that we don't have two per poly collision objects trying to get them to run into one another. That will not work. So um, the next thing we're going to talk about is just a generic term. It's called physics bodies. You'll hear this a lot. You'll also see it in the documentation. And I, the reason I just want to bring this up is because it's a term that's generic and does get thrown around a lot. And basically, it's just a way to describe a capsule or a collision hole or a sphere or something like that that can be used uh, for physics interactions. So we w call them physics bodies. Um, and this will be more prevalent when you start dealing with the fat editor. Um, you'll see the different names for physics bodies. But it's mm -hmm. something that is generic enough but also used quite a bit that I felt it was, it was uh, totally relevant for us to surface this particular term. So let's move on to static meshes. Now, static meshes collision, as we saw in here before, it's, v it's very simple. Um, you know, we open it up, we come here to collision, and we can add all types of different collision objects. I think I have collision turned off, maybe, no? Uh, there's no collision, or you have the, <laughs> as a oh, really yeah, 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 collision right. complexity. <laughs> yeah, ah, there hey, we go, there see, look, <laughs> I'm human too. So we have all these options, and of course, if you make it inside of a, a digital content creation package like uh, Maya or Max, it will come in the same. But the uh, reason we keep harping on collision is because collision is critical to having physics actually work. If there's no collision, physics will not work on a particular object. In fact, I think if I play this now, we should get some, yeah, interactions. Yep. But you can see the, f the uh, and we can, if I type in show, we can see the collision come in here. Yep. Um, you see why it was moving around so oddly is because it's a very odd shaped collision. But again, we would never have any of the physics interaction without having the collision. Oh. Um, no, you have something uh, you wanted to add? Yeah, uh, one other thing. If you don't have uh, any collision set up for your mesh and you have it set to movable and you want it to move around in your world, when you go to simulate or play, it actually will not do anything. It'll stick around and you'll get a map check warning saying, hey, it needs collision. So, um, OK. So next thing we're going to talk about is skeletal meshes. And let's see, I have a chain right here. So uh, when you want to have your skeletal mesh interact with something in the world, like uh, you know, hit something or something like that, that's where you're going to have to come here, go up to your create, generate a physical asset. And you can see that I've generated, uh, or I shouldn't say I generated, Unreal <laughs> generated so nicely for me uh, some capsules along this entire chain right here. So what I would do with this is if I pull this into the world, this very tiny chain, uh, and then I can come over here and I can look for my uh, uh, top for uh, first checkbox. Oh yep, simulate physics, <laughs> and I need my physics asset, which is oh I have no idea where it actually put that thing. It so. actually. I think it actually automatically assigns to the skeletal mesh. Does it? Okay. Um, the one that you're pointing to in the details panel is actually an override. Ah, okay. So we should have so it somewhere around here. Yes, and if you look under the physics section ah, here, there we go. physics assets you created is already assigned. So, and there's the physics asset right there again. So, and that's uh, when I put it in the world, what Tim was talking about is, you know, you can override at the asset level or you can override inside of the level. So I was looking at the level override. Again, it's... The beautiful thing about games is there's always multiple ways to do something. Did you have something, Tim? Yeah, actually, if we open up the physics asset real quick, um, just a really good way of debugging any kind of physics issues that are going on with your physics bodies, you can actually go to the simulate in the top layer and see how it reacts in this area. You can actually turn gravity off for this as well so that it, you can just grab it and move it around. You can see how it's actually interacting. Um, sometimes this is a good way of debugging 
something in, in bat versus actually in your game world to see if there's something that's maybe not working pro uh, properly. Yeah, because in fat, I'm actually doing this by holding down control on the right mouse button. I'm able to poke at this object and see how it will react. Versus if I tried to do this in the game, I would have to come up here, play it, make sure that my mouse was set up so that I could uh, apply uh, physics to whatever it is that I wanted to do. Um, as Tim said, doing it inside of the fat editor just makes it a lot easier when you're trying to check out how your constraints are working or something like that. Um, I think that's about it for skeletal meshes for now. Um, there is one other thing you can do with them. Uh, let's go here and find some levels. <coughs> and we're gonna, oh, and this map, um, if you haven't seen it or not, this is the content examples uh, physics map that we're using here. There's nothing fancy or anything that we set up. Um, this is the stuff that comes directly with uh, UE4. You can download this uh, right from the, the launcher. So what this map is doing is basically it's taking a pre-made animation and it's going to be blending it with physics, which is pretty cool. So if I click play here, you can see that if I get over here to one, basically it's playing full physics. Um, it's playing the full animation, but then it's also blending uh, full physics uh, on the spine up there. So we're getting this dude who's all, <laughs> he's, he's, he's a little inebriated, let me just put it that way. And if I can, uh, uh, no, the, <laughs> there it is. A little bit. <laughs> the, the, the mouse cursor either disappeared or it's really tiny. I can't tell. Uh, or I need better eyes. Um, as you can see, we have zero. So this is all animation. This is half between a physically blended uh, of, of physics, a physics simulation and the animation being blended together. And then one is, you know, it's all physics with the animation powering uh, his legs running. Um, and that's one thing that you can do with skeletal meshes mm -hmm. is combine them with a physics simulation like a ragdoll or something like that. But that's only applicable to skeletal mesh animations. You couldn't do that to a static mesh. And the, this kind of setup is really good for, uh, I see a lot of people always ask about how to do ponytails. Um, this right here is a very good uh, example of how to set something like that up where you're simulating beyond a certain bone. So yeah. it's like at your bone for the ponytail, it's like anything beyond that, it's just, you know, you can have it flop around and move uh, physically accurately the way it's supposed to, so. Yeah, that's a great, uh, or for like little dangly bits mm -hmm. that you want, um, like a gun or a baton or, I don't know, shoulder flaps or shoulder yep. pads on your armor or something like that, having this <laughs> blend between a physical having a you know the dude running like this and then mm -hmm. having the physics animation <laughs> handle of the flappy parts going off is a great way to not uh, make your animators want to kill you every time <laughs> you want to change your the way your armor looks <laughs> um, the next thing we're going to talk about with uh, physics uh, concerns particles more specifically GPU particles um, GPU particles can do physics um, which means that they can bounce off of objects within the scene and they use this doing the depth buffer um, I'm looking for a uh, particle system, but I'm not actually having one come up here. If it's easier, the particle map. Okay, actually, yeah, let's check that the out. The FX map actually has a. Let's try an example. It uses. The FX really quick, and um, or maybe particle. <laughs> and or maybe it's just effects map. Maybe it's just a third. Yeah, oh, there look, third time's <laughs> a charm. Look at that. And we'll let this bad boy load up. And uh, let's scroll down really quick, see if we've got any questions going on down here. Oh, we got a few of them. Okay, so I see this one says, I, I've been using complex as simple option in Unreal for meshes. Uh, is this advisable? Uh, just to kind of reiterate on this, I think it's a, a very big topic that, you know, it's, it, sometimes it's easier just to use the complex as simple for a short while, maybe just to test something out really quickly. But I, I would not recommend that as we, you know, kind of harped on a little bit earlier. It's, it's much more performant to use the, the box, the capsules, the, the spheres, or, or simple collision um, versus uh, per poly collision. So. Yeah, any 
any time you can use a simple simple collision versus anything per poly, it's always, excuse me, going to be infinitely cheaper for you to do. Absolutely. And while when you're first starting out, it can be a pain in the butt to make collision, it's one of those things you're just going to have to do. You're just going to have to bite the bullet. And uh, if you like Tetris, right, it's actually kind of a little <laughs> bit of fun trying to see how many collision primitives you can make an object have um, and still make it game ready. Um, but that also depends on your definition of the word fun. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, here from Luos, so uh, we have, uh, um, why do we call it the fat editor? Um, that's just a short for physics asset tool. Uh, yes, yeah, <laughs> physics, <laughs> physics asset tool. Um, that's, yeah, the yeah. only reason why. Yep. Uh, what are the caveats for per poly collision? Uh, again, this comes down to what exactly are you trying to do? If you are trying to make a scientifically accurate simulation, you would want you would want to use per poly because it's very precise, but again, Unreal doesn't have a scientifically correct physics simulation system. So while you would want while you'd want very correct physical interaction, you also have to ask yourself this question, and I say this a lot is, is somebody gonna notice at the speed of game? Well, as you're playing your game, and let's say you're playing like Borderlands or something like mm -hmm. that, and all of the crazy explosions that are going off and all of the debris and everything that's flying at me, is somebody really gonna notice that this one mesh or this one object doesn't precisely interact with the ground? And most likely they're not, because they're playing the game. Um, at the, at the speed of game, right. it's just people aren't going to notice that. So again, it's it's not, oh, I should never use this, or I should only use this. It's, does it really justify the amount of frame time that I'm gonna spend to calculate this for this particular object? And that's really what you have to ask yourself. This, this isn't a question up there, but just to jump <laughs> off a little bit of what you were saying. Um, oh, with the map wouldn't load because I forgot to hit the cancel button. Uh. <laughs> So, uh, again, just to give off of what you were saying a little bit, um, so with games and everything, is, and we were talking about concave versus you know convex earlier, um, when you're going near a wall and if it's like a curved wall or something, it's like you, you notice the character player will not get all the way up to the wall. I mean, otherwise you would clip right through. It's like, you know, so having geometry that's a little less accurate for collision, it, the player's really not going to notice a lot of that. Um, and if you do need more accurate collision using like traces and stuff like that to get a little bit more interaction, uh, that's a whole other subject. <laughs> so <laughs> now that I pressed the right button and the physics map came up. I was wondering why it froze for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering too. I was like, uh, did the whole thing freeze? <laughs> no, no. Uh, the, it was over on the other monitor behind our, behind our lovely uh, <laughs> questions. So what you see in front of us now is we have a GPU, um, uh, GPU particles being emitted from this emitter right here. And as you can see, they are... Uh, falling and colliding with the world. If I come here and I go to like, un or, I'm sorry, I should probably actually go to wireframe. Wireframe, you notice that all <laughs> of a sudden, hey, they've fallen completely through the floor and they're just raining down on there. Now if I come back here and I go back into lit mode, all of a sudden you see they are colliding with the floor. Um, the reason that is is because the GPU particles use the depth buffer. Uh, to determine where in the scene they should be colliding with. Well, when I go into wireframe mode, um, which I can do right here. I have no depth information. So that's why you are not seeing the collisions happen. One of the other things you'll notice is if you whip around really fast, sometimes you'll find particles fall through the world. Again, it uses the depth information uh, from the depth buffer to determine where the particle should be, should be lying or should, should fall within the world. Um, and if you don't have that information, it has nothing to do with it. Um, or it doesn't know where to put it in the world. Uh, let's see here. I just want the effect, and it looks like the whole thing is in a blueprint. Holy shnikes. What's <laughs> going on here? Um, uh, blueprint. Ah, there we go. And uh, where's my class settings? And, of course, I don't see the... Sorry, i got to get close. I'm getting old. Uh, where is the freaking... Do you see the particle in here? I don't know what mm -hmm. happened to it. 
Oh, it's because <laughs> I am <sighs> <sighs> the move stuff around on me all the time. All right. Ah, finally, okay. So let's go inside of here. And if we look for collision, so the first thing to get this to work is you see right here I have a, a data type, and I can come here and I can do my uh, type data, and I can put a new GPU sprite admitter uh, or module, I'm sorry, on this emitter. And what this is going to do is it's going to turn, if I just uh, single this guy out, uh, it's what, uh, what this is going to do is it's going to say this emitter within this particle system, every sprite that's on here that I'm emitting out is going to be on the GPU, which means I can have thousands of them, but I can also have collisions with them as well. Now, one of the other things to make note of uh, with particles that you want to have uh, with physics and things like that is that they can only be um, uh, camera-facing particles. You can't use like a mesh or a custom, uh, custom mesh or something like that or a square or something like that. It's not going to work. It can only be with a sprite-based particle. Um, and the physics is very, very simple on them, as you can see here. This is mainly just for, oops, uh, you can't see there. We want to close that window completely. This is mainly just for um, things like sparks or this looks a little bit like maybe lava or something like that, but for tiny little things that you need in your scene that you want to have um, some physics on them, that's what you would use these, these types of uh, the GPU particles for. Um, anything else uh, you want to talk about physical? Yeah, uh, just talking about particles real quick. Um, not an area I'm super familiar with, but distance fields. Uh, with 4.9, we actually have now where GPU particles can be affected by distance fields. So these can actually have collision with the world. And as Sam was saying, with you know the scene depth, if you're looking at it, it's it's there, and then you know you look away and you look back, and it's it can kind of go through the world. But um, using it with uh, distance fields, if that's enabled on your project, um, will allow it to use the sign distance field itself, so that it you can look away, you can look back, and the, the particles are actually falling where they're supposed to and sticking around. So it looks pretty cool if you haven't checked it out. Yeah. Uh, it's in the 4.9 4 release notes. There's yep. uh, a couple GIF images of that happening. Um, I would highly suggest you check it out. It's yeah, this pretty, pretty sweet. a really fun area. So, <laughs> so the next thing we're going to talk about is a physical material. And uh, I'll make a physical material really quick. So I right-clicked in the generic browser, in the content browser, I'm sorry. And under <laughs> physics, we have a physical material here. And uh, I'm just going to open it up. Now, what a physical material does, this is, this is actually a pretty cool system if you don't know about this. So basically, what I can do is I can generate physical materials for concrete or wood or sand or gravel or blood or any other type of surface or surf. Blood's not really a surface, but <laughs> any type of, uh, I don't know, interaction that I want to have that I know is going to be mm -hmm. standardized throughout my entire game. So in here, I can set different vari various properties. So for example, if I was making uh, a very, very slick surface like ice, I might want to give this a negative one. So I give it negative friction. So stuff just literally f slides right off of it. Um, then I can do something like I can change its restitution. Um, and just an FYI, restitution equi uh, equates to bounciness, <laughs> so, and it's on a zero, a zero to one scale. So like, this is fully bouncy, one, this is no bounce. Point three is not quite in the middle, uh. but almost there. Um, so if we're making uh, an ice surface, we might, you know, make this 0.25, because we don't want stuff to bounce off of it at all. Um, we have some destruction settings in here, and those will only uh, be valid if this is put on a destructible type of object. And let me see what else do we got here. I'm looking um, for, yeah. Uh, let's touch on the physical properties if you want at the moment. Because um, uh, it lists there for surface type. And if you look over at the default, um, there's no other drop downs. Um, so if you want to add your own physical surface uh, type properties, you can actually do this in the editor settings. Um, and we can make our own properties and then uh, set up what kind of interactions okay. we want to have there. Um, so if you go to Editor Preferences, and then you go to Physics. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Project Settings. I think it was. Oh, was it Project Settings? Sorry, <laughs> I'm oh backwards no. all the time. <laughs> Edit Project Settings. Yeah, and then ah, yeah, this looks more familiar. Yes. <laughs> then under physics. physics. And then at the bottom here, we have our physical surface um, types. 
and then you can set up here your own type of surfaces that you want to have. And these can actually be, I believe, called in blueprints and, and everything else. So and you can actually assign that to your physical material. So Wait. This is not like in the dragging <laughs> today. No, maybe because I didn't save it? No, I might have to check it out. I guess we'll make it work. Oh. Uh, Checkbox yeah, make it work. Mm, he's not showing up, but I'm not sure why. Mm -hmm. All right, go back to the project settings. Physics. Um. Hmm. I'm not sure why he's not showing up. I just tried mm. this at my desk, and that yeah. worked in that way. So maybe I did. <laughs> maybe I had something else set up. Um. I'm not sure right off. We will find out and we will post in the follow up to this one about how to get those to work. So we will we'll post back on that one. So you know, sometimes this happens. <laughs> sometimes. Thinking on uh, the fly. <laughs> so what's the other thing about physical materials that is awesome? Um you can also control um do they still have the sound and particle effects on there? Uh not directly on there. You can now call those, I believe not an area I'm super familiar with, but in your animation, I believe there's uh, like uh, yeah, the you sound cues. You and can do them as a notify. As, as a, a notify, notify, right. Okay. There you go. All right. Um, again, physical materials, it's a very, very easy way to unify all physics interactions across all surfaces. Um, basically, what I do when I'm working on something is if I make one that's concrete, right, and I'll set it up to however I want it with this particular bounciness and whatnot, and then for each concrete material, I will just slot in this physics material mm -hmm. uh, for concrete. That way, they will always have at least a physical material on them. And if you're using a material parent system, what I normally do is for my parent material, I will put in a physics system that does something weird, you know, make a weird noise mm -hmm. or something like that. So when mm -hmm. people are testing the game and they come up to an object and this object makes a weird noise, then they're like, oh, this object's making a weird noise. That means it doesn't have a physical material on it. Um, so that's a great way to kind of help QA your game yourself mm -hmm. uh, while it's still in development to ensure that everything has all the, the different little bits and pieces that it needs to function the way that you want it to function. So the next thing we're going to touch on, and I do believe this is the last thing, and we're going to talk about uh, increasing your performance by turning on sub-stepping. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on sub-stepping, which is in our Project settings? No. Uh, yes, uh, Wait, it's under. It's down somewhere. here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I hit it to move it out of the way, and then I rarely moved it out of the way. Uh, so it's yeah, under. Is it under, under physics? Uh, yeah, it's under physics. And, and uh, sub stepping is in under the frame rate section. So here in the right, just up a little bit. Ah, there up we go. Two, there we go. I forgot to turn it on. So now sub, sub stepping has been enabled. Tim actually knows a little bit more about this <laughs> than I do. Just a little, though. <laughs> <laughs> but basically what this is going to do is physics substepping is going to ensure that your physics calculations always stay in step with your game. Um, you could have the physics take place and then something else in your game takes place, which would make the physics run out of sync, mm -hmm. which means they would have to catch up. Right. Um, physics substepping allows you to have your physics calculation run in parallel with your game. Um, it also helps you from having like a crazy physics, you know, go fly off <laughs> uh, when something impacts them a little. Uh, uh, and give you uh, more uh, more accurate physics calculations yeah. as well. Uh, especially um, if you have like a chain of physics that you're, you know, you're, you're doing like a bunch of joints in a ponytail mm -hmm. or you're swinging a bunch of objects together like on a chain or something like that. Physics substepping will help give you better performance and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, more um, predictable, predictable <laughs> physics interaction. <laughs> it's just bloop, right out of the brain yeah. sometimes. So, um, Again, see, just totally just, psh, my train of thought went right <laughs> out the window. Uh, 
Now knowing which, now this is what I was trying to say, knowing which settings to set here is entirely dependent on your project, what your project is trying to achieve. If your project is making you know, a billiards game that's fully physics driven, or a pinball machine, or a Rude Goldberg mm -hmm. machine, you're gonna want to enable physics substepping and get the settings here, you're gonna have to tweak them. You're gonna have to right. figure out what works specifically, what works better for you than what the standard setup is. Or maybe the standard setup does work, but this is something mm -hmm. you need to fine tune. You really, really need to test this when you turn it on. And that's simply just, I turn this on, write down what your frame rate is. You know, oh, my frame rate is now at 60, and I turn it off, my frame rate is now at 40. So obviously this did something to give me 10 FPS back. Again, I just pulled those numbers out of thin <laughs> air. Um, but just to kind of give you an example of why I'd, wa I'd want to use this particular uh, this particular option. Yep. We do also have a really good documentation page um, that was originally like a blog post that actually has all the information here talking about physics upstepping and just going over some more of the, the finer details about it. So. One of the other things that I would suggest turning on substepping if you've run into this problem is if you have problems with your ragdolls settling on the ground mm -hmm. or they're just not reacting correctly to physical inputs or they're just you'll see them, they'll be, their foot might jiggle a lot like this. You might need to increase or en enable right. physics substepping to address issues like that. But again, if you do enable this feature, make sure that you thoroughly performance test your project because it's going to add some extra CPU complexity mm -hmm. and it's going to take uh, CPU processing time away from you. So you need to make sure that that is justifiable in your particular project. Um, so let's see, we've, we've touched on per poly collision, which is mm -hmm. a big thing. Yep. Um, we've talked about particles. I know we've talked a lot about collision, but collision <laughs> is super important for physics to work. Absolutely. Um, let's go ahead and drop down into some of the Q&A questions here. So, so there are currently no plugins, external software that we can integrate into UE4 to simply move all the physics to the GPU, even if it's GPU specific, NVIDIA, AMD. There is oh. nothing that I know of. However, <laughs> again, since we give you the C++, all you mm -hmm. gotta do is download it from GitHub. There is nothing that's stopping you from putting in something or uh, paying somebody to put something in right. for you that will move <laughs> all of these calculations over to your specific GPU of choice. Um, uh, that's one of the many, many wonderful things about UE4 is you don't have to wait on us to do this. If this is something yeah. that you were like, I need this and I wanted it yesterday, you can go in there and put, put it in yourselves. That's not to say that something might not come out in the future. Um, I, have n I don't know of anybody who's working on anything like this. I don't know, if maybe no. Tim does, no? No, <laughs> so it, it, it could be there, but again, you have the power to do this if that's really what you want to do with it. So it's not that you can't, it's just we don't have anything in there at the present point in time. Uh, see here, NVIDIA Physics Apex support for UE4 is still uh, CPU based. Um, this is going back that, that everything with UE4, we want it to be uh, agnostic as far as GPUs go. So it, it's going to work on NVIDIA, it's going to work on uh, an AMD CPU or GPU. So uh, it, it, it's got to work on everything. When, y when is using CCD? D a good idea, and is there a performance implication for this? So CCD is continuous collision detection. Right. <sighs> I would use it on <laughs> something like if I had a. <laughs> have you ever seen silly soccer on the? Yes, forums? I have. Okay, I have seen. Silly so soccer. I would use it on the <laughs> soccer ball inside of silly soccer, right. um, because I want to make sure the ball doesn't fall through the world, or that mm -hmm. it doesn't go through a character, or, or a mesh, or something like that. But that's the only object I would put it on. Yeah. Plus, I would make sure that I would profile it mm -hmm. once I have enabled it. Because, again, you're going to be taking something away from the CPU, so you need to make sure that it's justified, and that, you know, you might have to end up cutting, say, back on some of your materials, or some of your uh, scene collision. You know, it, it, again, it's a careful balancing act to make sure that it is totally justifiable and you enabling this option. Uh, let's see, I've been using the complex collision as simple option in Unreal for meshes. Is this advisable? Sure, if you're just white boxing and you're like, you know, I don't mm -hmm. have time to really make proper collision for this and the, the simple box doesn't allow me to run around, sure, totally, but as soon as your level goes into production or as soon as your level is ready for the artist to start meshing up 
or anybody besides you to start using, you need to turn that off in order to ensure that people don't forget that they need to make collision for this <laughs> particular set of stairs. Uh, if you're running around a level and you've got 100 messages you have to make, and you keep running up and down these stairs to test stuff, it might not just or might not uh, come on in your head that hey, I never made collision yep. for these meshes. Yep. They just kind of worked. You might not think about that when you have a hundred meshes to make. So, for you for white boxing, go ahead, do it. But as soon as you're done, as soon as it's ready to go off yes. onto somebody else's <laughs> plate, disable everything. <laughs> Give it to them so they fall right through the world. So the first thing <laughs> they have to do is like, oh man, I got to put a, a blocking volume in here so I can actually move right. around. This is here. Uh, how do you recommend, recommend setup for a large building sized static mesh? Lots of DGCs uh, created boxes or auto generated? Um, usually for larger meshes, I would actually recommend breaking those up into smaller pieces. Uh, something like a building, um, you, you're going to want to use more modular design and then actually have either blocking volumes or individual like simple shape uh, collision for yeah. those. And if you're building it, you know, you can. Um I only know 3D Max, so I can explain to this how you <laughs> how this works in 3D Max. But if I'm making uh, like I made the Flavian Coliseum for my college project, and I had a bunch of columns in there, and I needed a, just to make like a, a sphere that comes up like this. Well, Unreal's Auto Tool wasn't doing everything that I needed. Mm -hmm. I didn't need it on the tops and the bottoms. I just needed it in the center. So what I did is I took a sphere, and I gave the sphere, or I'm sorry, a cylinder. I took a cylinder gave the cylinder the same name as my mesh, so it was SM column 00. I have now UCX SM mm -hmm. mesh 00 underscore collision hole underscore 00. So what that, I what that does is basically when I import it, I will have my mesh with my custom made collision that I made inside of 3D Max. And the key to getting that to work is to make sure that your collision hole has the UCX identifier on it, but its name is the na same name as the mesh. And this is, in my opinion, the fastest way to make Absolutely. stuff. Um, unless you're doing something like a, like a dirt hill, uh, then using the auto convex tool inside of mm -hmm. Unreal, there's, there's nothing that I have seen that will match that precision that you can get from the auto convex on uh, non-organic objects inside of Unreal. Or, I'm sorry, on organic objects mm -hmm. inside of Unreal Engine Often 4. Often a lot of people focus on you know, just the graphics match, you know, what you're actually seeing in the game. Uh, I mean, as much love should be given to the collision mesh and the UVs and everything else as well for optimizing. It shouldn't just be getting as low poly an object in there that looks the fidelity you want, but you know, just using uh, you know as low poly a collision mesh that you can get away with as well. So, see, how would you recommend collision setup for a building? Oh wait, did we just read that one? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that one's in there twice. My bad. If only one object can have per poly, how would you do an accurate pinball table? <laughs> how would I make um. an accurate pinball table? <sighs> I would get Ori, <laughs> <laughs> our physics programmer. No, <laughs> um, it's it's going to be difficult right out of the box to get a a super duper accurate physics simulation to happen because again. Our physics, our physics system is a great stepping stone to get you basics physics interaction, to get you stuff that is believable, and mm -hmm. you can totally ship a game with the basics physics system. When you start to get into, you know, oh, I want to make a physically correct uh, pinball game or a physically correct billiards game, that's when you're going to have to start getting into more custom uh, C++ based approaches for physics. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't really speak too much about that because it's simply completely out of my realm of expertise on what would be required to go into that. Like, um, I mean, you could look into like, I just know like the bullet physics library, or yeah. there's um, I mean, uh, even Havoc, I think is NVIDIA's website one. has a lot of great documentation on there. A lot of it's over my head, you know, C++ and whatnot, but I mean, they have all their libraries there and all their information. Um, it's, it's a free account to sign up for, and uh, it's just a great resource. So. Yeah, so I know that doesn't necessarily answer your, your question right. about <laughs> how you would do this how you would make an accurate pinball table. The, the problem is, is how accurate is accurate, right? My accurate is, am I able to at least score? Like, you know, does it give me the same feeling that Windows pinball gave me for XP? Is it that much fun? And yeah, if it is, then, then um, you know, if you're gonna get that much fun out of it, it doesn't need to be crazy super accurate. 
but again, it, it all comes back down to you know, setting up your physics objects uh, with performance and gameplay mm -hmm. in mind. You know, if you set up that f that uh, pinball table and you find out, you know what, hey, this actually works pretty well mm -hmm. if I just have the ball set to per poly, you might not need to do anything else. You honestly might not. Um, but if you start to see like the bumpers aren't working the way that you want or things of that nature, you would have to look into, you know, possibly writing some code that shoots the ball back, you know, in, in a different direction using the dot product or, or something like that, so that you always get the same behavior. Um, and, and no, that's not really the greatest answer for your question, <laughs> but it's, it's a hard question to answer because there's yeah. so many more questions right. that it raises. Yeah, it's such a broad topic, so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, here. Is there an upper limit on the number of boxes slash spheres in a single actor? Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there probably is. Yeah, uh, there probably, I think in UE3, and I could be totally dead wrong about this, but I think you couldn't have more than like 50. Oh no, more than 50 generated a warning. Yeah, more okay. than 50 generated a little warning that yeah. says like, your this XXX mesh has more than 50 collision primitives. Right. Please optimize this. Um, again, each <laughs> one you add is going to add another, uh, it's not as bad as uh, with uh, rendering and adding another um, material ID, but the more collision you have, the more collision has to be put into the uh, the physics thread. And that's all on CPUs, so you're yeah, limited there yeah. you know, so, a little bit, so. So, it, so you don't want to bottle like less, that. Less is more right. with, with collision. What physics effects? can we apply in a particle system? So um, this one I think, talking about the effects of like a crosswind, um, you can use GPU particles with something called a vector field. And what a vector field is, is a predefined velocity and magnitude um, that when the, when the GPU particles enters the vector field, it basically picks up how fast it should be going and the direction it should be going and it goes off in that direction really, really fast, or it can do like a crazy swirl or something like that. The cool thing about this is that um, these will give you like those, uh, you see it in the elemental demo with his eyes when they open up, you see all those, uh, those particles that go out, that's a vector field. Um, they're not, I'm gonna say they're physically based because it's a predefined, you're giving it a predefined, uh, velocity in a predefined direction, so you're telling it where to go instead of saying, hey, these are physically, in, uh, ac or phys has physics enabled, do X when you interact with them. This other uh, vector field is says, shoot these particles in this direction at this speed, and that comes in relatively free. Oh, is there a way to make certain parts of a texture be different physical materials when using one texture environment? I'm actually there, not sure. There used to be. I don't know yeah. if this is still the case. Um, I'm not sure if you can actually mask it or. There used to be a <laughs> physical material. Uh, let me see if they. Oh, it used to be a physical material mask, right? Yeah, yeah. And I don't know. I don't know if it got removed or if we do it a different way. Uh, and this is something I can I can check in more uh, detail offline. But basically, right. in UE three, what you could do is you can make a bit mask, which is just simply a one channel texture. It's black or white, and it's literally white is on and black is off, mm -hmm. and you could specify white equals this physical material, black equals this physical material. So you could have something like a door that has glass so that when you shoot across it, you get wood on the wood mm -hmm. and you get glass on the glass. Um, I can check and see if that yeah. has been- I recall been this question coming up recently somewhere. I yeah. can't remember exactly where, but uh, I, know, I can look into it. As I know well, it was so. in UE3 because I yeah. used it quite heavily in one of the games I worked on before I came here to Epic um, because I kept getting bugs about having like, the <laughs> glass has wood decals and I'm like, who's gonna notice <laughs> at the speed of game that the glass has wood decals? And then they <laughs> introduced this feature. I'm like, sweet, I don't get these bugs anymore. So. Let's uh, see here. Is creating yeah. your collision in BSP advisable for an entire world? Um, I'm going to assume you mean blocking volume instead of BSP. Um, we can cover both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can cover yeah, both. Yeah, because uh, uh, BSP itself, you know, has its own collision. Um, it's it's not really advisable. Uh, 
BSP is stay a, away from BSP if at all possible. It's a prototyping tool. Um, don't use this as final stuff. Like you can use it in your final game, but I wouldn't recommend a lot of them. Um, it can be a little CPU intensive. So it um, also has used to. And I'm <laughs> not sure how this is in UE4. Um, it used to have issues with uh, occluding objects and things like that. Mm -hmm. So if you had like a big BSP wall somewhere, you wanted to hide a bunch of stuff behind it, it didn't work super hot with the uh, was H HVIZ or uh, the occlusion method that just totally fell out of my brain. I don't know but what's going on with To get back to what we originally thought you meant was with blocking volumes, um, if you actually open up the Blueprint Office uh, example, that entire world is using blocking volumes for its, its collision. Uh, and that's one other thing I wanted to bring up. Um, blocking volumes in some instances can be as cheap or cheaper mm -hmm. than having a uh, static uh, bunch of collision primitives. For example, let's say you had uh, some organic, I don't know, um, like just some organic, like I can't even think of anything <laughs> now. Like I'm thinking of the the, the big monster from uh, Big Trouble in Little China that's in the that's in the hallway <laughs> with the multiple eyes. So you have some some yeah. circular object, some circular monster or something like that, and you try to do the auto convex and it puts 20 holes on it. <laughs> You're like, dude, that's really expensive for yes. this thing. Well, what you could do and is just put it in the world, remove those 20 collision holes, and then just put a blocking volume over it. And the player will be able to intersect with the blocking volume, but you won't get that expense of all of the extra uh, collision that you wouldn't be able to make use of in the first place. Uh, is it possible to only render the collision within a specific range? I think maybe do they mean like could you only have collision like in the center of an object or something like that? Uh, collision is more all or nothing. Either you have collision or right. you don't have it. Um, right. I mean, if the mesh is occluded and it's not in view, then it's not there. Yeah. So um, you also <laughs> wouldn't want to turn collision off based off of distance, um, because then you'd have to turn it back on. So you'd have to. You'd end up. If you're trying to do this for like an optimization, I think that's mm -hmm. kind of what this sounds like to me. You'd end up spending more time setting your scene back mm -hmm. up than you would gain from actually turning the stuff off and then turning it back on. Like right. there would be better ways to optimize, such as your draw count or your amount of material IDs or material complexity. Um, that's what I would look at first before I started optimizing collisions and things like that. Because as we said, it, it is CPU intensive, but the thing is, is that it's the last thing that is CPU intensive that could start to cause performance problems. So if you have ex performance problems, don't automatically think, oh man, I must be using too much collision. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be a lot of other things on the performance optimization list that come before collision, like material complexity, ma the amount of material IDs, the amount of objects in the scene, things like that. So it is something that will, will have an effect, but it's not a, oh my god, I need to drop everything and optimize my collision. Um, that's not going to get you back a whole bunch. It will get you back a little bit, but not as much as you might think. Um, let's see what else have we got here. Hmm. Sorry, we're, um, we're going down some more questions here. There's. I mean, I, I can kind of touch on this one a little bit. It's it's kind of a loaded gun question, but it's the the very first one, the one on Crackdown Three. It's like I know a lot of people have been asking about this with. Oh, hey, I have no idea because I never played the Crackdown um, Three. Um, I mean, I, I, I only saw the demo video and everything. Um, and uh, Detroit, well, uh, if anyone follows me on the forums, <laughs> knows that's kind of an area I, I really have fun with. But um, it's it's one of those things that Destructibles and UE4 are they can be very CPU intensive since the everything is handled on the CPU. Um, since they're doing everything server side um, and networked, uh, there, there's a lot of stuff there that's not automatically set up in UE4, um, and it's not an easy setup process either. So it, it probably requires some code implementation, um, a, a bunch of other setup than, than this could be answered in a single question. Um, let's see if there's some more. Any plans to let us alter world gravity? Um, I know it's on the trailer board. <laughs> <laughs> if it's on the board, then it's <laughs> at least on somebody's radar. Right. But I can't, um, uh, I, can't I, give you a yeah. I don't know of an estimated uh, time when a that time date on that one. Um, 
I've seen some people write some, uh, probably about a year ago, I saw someone, they had done some custom code to actually do it, and it was, it was really interesting. Uh, there's the one on there about covering the settings in for uh, the project settings. Someone just wanted a brief overview. Yeah, we can do that really quick. Now, some yeah. of these settings, I will tell you uh, right out of the gate, some of this stuff, I don't know exactly yeah. what it does because I never touch it. Right, some of this. Uh, uh, because I'm I don't, I don't, I'm I don't have same to. Um, I mean, a lot of the stuff you're going to see in here, especially like under the simulation tab, is stuff that's already available in your physical material. For instance, like the uh, the friction combined mode and, and some of these, and it's like if you hover over them, you'll actually get you know a little bit of a description. I think actually the documentation has a little bit more information yeah. to cover uh, some of this as well. Let's see what about um, Get rid of the physics surface. Uh, so down in the frame rate areas, uh, like we touched on uh, substepping a little bit, um, substepping async um, under the. Actually, it, Sam, if you go up um, one more under simulation and you expand that box, there's the option for enable async scene. There's not really a, a lot of documentation on this, but um, and I'd, I'd probably have to speak with Ori or at least someone and just get a more refined answer for the forms or whatever, but uh, um, it is recommended to actually use a lot of your destructibles uh, with async scene, um, but that actually will disable collision if other objects are not using async scene as well on movement and, and whatnot. There's, there's some caveats to using so it. So async will run it in parallel to what's going on. Right. So that, because it's basically like, uh, this is probably greatly oversimplifying this, <laughs> but think of it as I've got my scene going on and then I run my physics over here mm -hmm. on something else and I'm doing it in parallel, well, one right. with the other it's hard to get them to crosstalk. Right. And that's right. what he's talking about is if it's not, if I have something set up for async that's going on over here, it's going to interact with the async stuff. But if I have something that's uh, just regular physics over here running, you could run into issues getting those two things mm -hmm. to actually meet up and and have a, a physics uh, a physics simulation. Um, like a, a decent example, I've seen that this one work before, was actually having a projectile that's in async scene. So when you shoot it, you actually have all your destructibles are in async scene as well, um, so that they actually interact together in that sense. But uh, it's a little bit more performant with, uh, with destructibles, but again, it's like there's not really a clear example out there or anything with it, but it's something I can definitely dig into and help you guys out with if you yeah. have questions. And then we have one question here about uh, networked physics. And, excuse me, with one of the other people, uh, Wes Bunn on the learning resource team, we're working on a, a networked-based game um, which we can uh, look into see if we could maybe add a little bit of a, s a little section in there about um, setting up uh, networked physics. Um, just pretty simple stuff so you guys can get uh, get things working, um, whether it's something that's on your local client or something that's on the server um, or, or things of that nature. Um, it's definitely something we can see if we can get a little bit of info in there for you. Um, we're just going over the questions right now, trying to see if there's anything that we missed or anything that uh, we can answer again. So, yep, it looks like that's pretty much it for us uh, for today. Um, if you guys got any questions or there's something that uh, we didn't touch on or that you want to know more about, please post it in the forums. Um, there are a couple other questions in here that I'm going to send over to Ori, uh, our resident physics programmer, to explain, because he can give a better explanation than I'm sure myself or Tim could <laughs> about these uh, about these particular areas like max dependent velocity. I'm not, I have no clue what that is, uh, and I'm not even going to try to explain it. So uh, if there's no more questions, we're going to go ahead and call it here. And uh, I want to thank everybody for watching it, watching today. And uh, yeah, send us any questions or any feedback or anything post to the forums. So that's it. Thanks a lot, guys. And Thank we you. will, guys and gals, I'm sorry. <laughs> and we will see you next time. Thanks.